In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, and my song. This cornerstone, this solid crown, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took our flesh, born is a God in helpless faith, and gifts of life and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came. To sing till on that cross that Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I said, There in the ground, his body. cry to final breath Jesus commands my destiny no power of hell no scheme of man can ever block me from his death to be returned Jesus 
Welcome to Hope Valley Church. God's love and his goodness reaches each of us wherever we are today. We look forward to hearing Reverend Scott Button as he shares a message in our Cornerstone series based on the Apostle Peter's first letter. Scott is the executive pastor of Hope Valley Church and has a particular interest in helping people grow spiritually and in community by connecting people to God and to other people. Pastor Scott has been serving for six years in our ministry team. Please welcome Scott Button. It's great to be with you, our growing Hope Valley Church community, both locally and further afield. Lately, I've been uh, very deliberately asking people when I'm talking to them, whether it's over the phone or on Zoom, everyone seems to be Zooming at the moment, but I'll be asking them this, how are you going? How are you going emotionally? How are you going spiritually? How are you going financially? How's your family coping with these social restrictions? I'm very deliberate about asking that question because we're in this season where things have been shaken up for people, where our foundations uh, have been kind of let loose, whether it be people's social and family norms, their work and finances, their education, even their future plans have been shaken loose. You know, recently Mary and I attended the funeral of a much-loved aunt. She was 96 but there were only 10 people there. When normally there probably would have been over 100, she was a well-loved lady. My own brother, who's a farmer, has a yearly on-farm ram sale. This year, he's looking at having to have his ram sale online. Some close friends were so looking forward to their daughter's wedding in England. They'd all booked their holidays, the, the tickets and everything, and yet when the time came, they couldn't go. And she was married with her now husband and the priest present. No one else. Things have been shaken. And and maybe that's a, a gift from God because it's caused many of us to ponder what really is important. What really is the bedrock that will stand the test of time that I can build my life on? It's a question we might normally ask when things are going well, but we ask in a time like this. And whenever I think about those kind of questions, I'm drawn to the image of Uluru. Here in Australia, we have this magnificent monolith, Uluru, in the dead centre, in the heart of our continent. It's been special for the Anagu tribes of Central Australia for centuries. Now people love to flock there to see this magnificent rock. There's something about it, its grandeur, its massive size, its sense of permanence and durability. But it also kind of reminds us as we look at something like that, that we actually are quite small. And there are things in life beyond us that are bigger than us, that endure longer than we do. When I think about Uluru, it reminds me of this wonderful truth that God has gone before us and laid a firm foundation, a cornerstone that will never be shaken. It's called the rock of salvation. And this stone is more enduring, more beautiful than Uluru ever will be. And this rock, unlike Uluru, is alive. It's dynamic and it transforms the lives of all who build upon it. Upon this rock, we can build our lives with great confidence. You know, the Apostle Peter, who wrote to some of the young churches in a letter, wrote this about this living stone. You'll find it in 1 Peter chapter 2 from verse 4. And he wrote this, As you come to him, Jesus, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious in his sight, You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And he goes on and he quotes Isaiah in the Old Testament. He says, See, I lay in Zion a stone in Jerusalem, that that metaphorical, symbolic heart of God's kingdom, a chosen and precious cornerstone, a foundation stone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame and never be disappointed. When Peter wrote these words, he had in mind the Jewish temple of his day in Jerusalem, this magnificent edifice up on a hill that you could see from miles around. It was made out of dressed stone. It was built upon these massive foundation stones that held it square and true. 
And at this temple, people would come to offer their devotion to God. But one of the things about this temple was that only Jewish men who were circumcised and ritually clean could enter the forecourt in front of the temple. No one else could get there. Them and the special priests who were all men. But when they got there, all they could do was hand over their offerings, their sacrifices to this small special group of the priesthood who would offer their sacrifices on their behalf. They couldn't even go into the temple. They could only stand and watch as spectators. But in comparison, Peter says, we can come to him, this living stone. This speaks of a relationship, not a a set of religious practices. It speaks of a person that we can know deeply, intimately in a robust and dependable relationship, of someone who is not distant but near and ever present in our lives, someone who cares deeply for us and engages with us someone who anyone can come to no matter who they are. We see this in Jesus as he walked the dusty roads and the streets of Israel in the first century when he would hang out with all kinds of people around a meal, invite himself even to people's homes where he would kneel down and he would lay a hand on or embrace a beggar or a leper, those deemed unclean that others would steer away from. In comparison to that inanimate temple, Peter says Jesus is a living foundation stone, one that animates and gives life to people so that they also become living stones being built into this dynamic spiritual temple where they can all offer a service that is acceptable to God. Think about that. That is radical. And he finishes by saying, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame or disappointed. You know, it speaks of Jesus' enduring nature, the permanence of his presence in our lives. And unlike the Jewish temple that you had to go to and was only in one fixed place, Jesus could be with you wherever you are. It also speaks of the dynamic, enduring and abundant life that Jesus enables those who trust in him to live. Now, if this is the stone chosen by God and precious in his sight, And if God has laid Jesus as the foundation for us all to build our lives on, then it begs this question. Is Jesus the foundation you are building your life upon? Now, everyone's building their life upon some foundation. There are those who build without thinking about it, but by default, they're building their life on some kind of foundation of their own making, often with many cracks and flaws. Others will do it deliberately. They'll build upon a foundation of a healthy bank balance, a good education, an enjoyable, fulfilling, productive job, satisfying relationships, living a balanced and fruitful life. You know, back when I was in year 12, contemplating what I'd do with my life after school, boy, that is a long time ago. All of those things kind of came up in my thinking and they were all centred around what I perceived back then would make my life happy. Now, none of those things are necessarily bad in themselves, but are they able to endure? Are they things that if I build my life upon them only, they will stand the test of time? But then we have Jesus, the perfect foundation for your life. What is it that makes him that sure foundation, that cornerstone of permanence? Well, there are three things. He provides the way, he shows the way, and he keeps the way open for you. Jesus provides the way. He is the risen, crucified Lord. He is the one who has paved the way for us through his death and resurrection. And he is that for anyone who will put their faith in him. You know, he has won the victory for each person over sin, over Satan and over death and he's done it for us. And Jesus is both willing and able to forgive you, to heal you, to provide for you, to guide you, to transform your life from the inside out. 
And Jesus imparts to us as a free and wonderful gift the fullness of his righteousness, his peace, his joy. And so in other words, Jesus has laid the foundation for us so that we might build our lives. He's done it all. There's nothing more that we need to do or add to it, but put our faith in him. Not only does he provide the way, Jesus shows the way. He is our great example of how to live this life built upon him. In the Bible, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, faithfulness, kindness, gentleness, mercy, love, self-control, all of these things. And when we look at Jesus, we see them all in him. His character is perfect. Jesus is just. He's merciful. He's both full of grace, that unconditional undeserved favour that he gives us, but also holds to God's truth faithfully. He's pure of heart. He's the same in, day in, day out. He never changes. And as he lived his life, he was always faithful and obedient fully to the Father, a perfect life. He was a true servant who laid down his life for others. And even as he did that, though, he did not lose who he was himself. He didn't lose his identity. And so he becomes God's great example of how we can live and with his help should live. But not only that, Jesus also keeps the way open. He's unchanging. He's eternal. You know, life, there are ebbs and flows through history, through humanity. There are circumstances that come our way that knock us off our pedestal, but nothing changes him. And as much as he's prepared heaven for us, Jesus walks with us daily to prepare us for heaven. You know, we all know, if we're honest, we stumble along the way sometimes. We fall, we trip over our own feet out of ignorance out of our willful bad decisions, out of circumstances that trip us up like a stone in the path. But he's there with us as we walk our daily life, actively engaged with us, helping us, picking us up, encouraging us, guiding us so that we can get to the finish line in wonderful shape as he intended for us to. You know, as he keeps the way open, he has your back in every situation. And so we can live like this ancient uh, leader of the early church who lived in the late first century, early second century. His name was Polycarp. He actually was a disciple of John, one of the first apostles. He knew John who wrote some of the scriptures. And at the age of 86, the Romans in their region decided they didn't like the Christians and they had rounded them up and they had to denounce their faith or be martyred. And so they'd rounded up Polycarp, this 86-year-old saint, this beautiful man of God, dragged him off in front of this public kind of gathering to make a spectacle of his death. And they said to him, you can live, Polycarp, if you will deny Jesus and proclaim Caesar. And Polycarp said this with a sure and steady voice. 86 years have I served him and he has done me no wrong. How can I deny my king and saviour now? And Polycarp went to the stake and was burnt alive. But he could do that because he knew Jesus had his back. He kept the way open for him right to the end. And so if that's the cornerstone that God has laid for us, then why wouldn't you want to build your life upon Jesus? And if you do, then I guess the next question is, how do I build my life upon Jesus? Well, firstly, by believing in him. And that means entrusting him to forgive your sins, not someone else's yours, to trust him with your pain, the poverty of your spirit, that he would bring healing to you and he would bring renewal and transformation in your life. Trusting him with your daily needs. You know, Jesus taught us to pray, Father, give us today my daily bread. And to trust him that his promises are true, not for someone else, but for you and to live accordingly. The second thing we can do is to walk with him daily as the priority relationship in our life. That means before your spouse, your kids, your mum and dad, your best friends. That might sound harsh, but it's true. Make Jesus the priority in your life. And we do that by reading his word 
talking with him, the living word, listening to him, letting your heart be shaped by his heart, letting his character seep into you and shape your character to be like his. You know, around Hope Valley Church, we, one of our four key values is being open to God's word, his written word in the scriptures, but Jesus himself as the living word. Now, this is a relationship that we live out in our ordinary, everyday lives. And your life is different to mine as mine is different to yours. And so while there are things that are the same, there are things that are different. And I can't walk in that relationship for you. You have to. And you can't do it for your spouse or your kids. They need to learn to walk with Jesus day by day. And the third thing we do to build upon this foundation is by obeying him and living out your God-given purpose that Jesus has designed you for. The scriptures tell us that Jesus has sovereignly shaped you so you can make a unique difference in this world and with his mission in this world. And again, that's why at Hope Valley, one of our key values is to have a heart for God's mission, to lean into it, to discover it, to follow it through. Now, the Bible does say that we should work as a team, serve together. We're Actually, we are. We're better together. But you have to find that unique God-given shape and fit that God has given you, your gifts, your personality and how to use them. I can't do that for you. You have to do it for yourself and you can't do it for me. You know, there may be two people uh, that have the same passion to support and help the disadvantaged, but as one works that out in their life, they may see Jesus leading them to serve in a local church where they hand out food parcels. And to another, Jesus guides them into uh, government policy developing social policy for the disadvantaged. It might be in the same family, there are two people with the gift of teaching. But as they work that out following Jesus, one is led into the classroom with students. Another is led into a corporate boardroom where they teach people how to be servant leaders for the sake of their organisation. Now, when you make those three folk either the kind of the intent of each of your days, then your life will be built into a beautiful house with many rooms. It's a house that will be a comfort and a blessing to you. It's a house that will become a comfort and a blessing to many others as well. But like a new house, it doesn't get built overnight. It's built one brick at a time. You know, currently I'm working at home and I take, stretch my legs, get away from the computer, go out the backyard and I look over the side fence Two blocks down, one of our neighbours has got a new house being built in their yard and, and I'm watching it be built with interest. It started as a hole in the ground or lots of holes, then this solid foundation, flat, square and true. And now they're putting up the framework and the gables bit by bit. They've been at it for a few weeks and there are many weeks, if not months left, before it becomes a house people can enjoy. You know, your life being built upon the foundation of Jesus is a lifelong journey and it'll take time. You won't get there immediately, but that's okay. You know, I look back on my late teens and early 20s when my faith was fairly immature and I look back and I go, wow, look what God did, even though I didn't really know what I was doing because he'd gone before me and he'd already laid a foundation that I naively in some ways was building this foundation upon. But he's kept building into my life as I've desired to build upon him. You know, sometimes I look back and I, I kind of go, I wish I could live those years again with what Jesus has built into my life. Now I could do so much better. But I don't need to and I don't have to because his grace is enough for me. It was enough for me back then. It's enough for me now and it's enough for me. It's enough for you in the future as you continue to build your life upon him as your cornerstone. And as much as we need to be intentional, deliberate about putting our faith in Jesus and building our life upon him as this solid rock, in the end, he's not only the foundation, he's the master builder and we're his apprentice. He shows us how to do it. He only needs a heart that leans fully into him. 
He only needs a will that that is open to his guiding hand and he will make sure that our life is built fully and abundantly into all that God wants it to be. So why wouldn't you build your life upon Jesus as your foundation? You know, I made that decision roughly 47 years ago. And as I look back, I know I never could have built my life to what it is today if Jesus wasn't my foundation. The depth of my faith, the assurance that I live with, the the people I've been able to engage with and help and encourage is really in the end all because my life has been built upon this wonderful foundation, Jesus Christ. And the same can be true for you as well. It's true for anyone who will put their faith in Jesus. So be a wise builder. Build upon the foundation that he's laid for you. He's done it for you. And if you do, you will never be put to shame or ever be disappointed. As you've been listening, you may want to pray this prayer with me. Take a moment. It'll be on the screen just to read some of the words. And if you would like, pray it with me now. It's a prayer of saying, Lord, I'm going to make you my foundation. Lord Jesus, thank you that you've laid a foundation for me to build my life upon. I humbly surrender my life to you that you may become my cornerstone and that you would lead me in your ways. Teach me how to build my life upon your precepts. And Lord, may my life bring you honour and overflow in ways that bring benefit to others. Amen. You know, today, if you've been listening and you'd like to talk more about this with someone and if you've got someone nearby, then talk with them. But if you don't, then connect with me. Use that connect button in the chat column uh, on the online service this morning or contact me, Scott Button, at hello at hopevalleychurch.com.au. May you find peace, joy, meaning, purpose, blessing as you seek to build your life upon Jesus as your foundation.
fighters, I'll stand strong and worship you. If it puts me through the fire, I rejoice cause you're there too. And I won't be for my feelings, or hold fast to what is true. Cause if the cross brings transformation, I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway into resurrection life. And if I join you in the suffering, then I'll join you where you rise. And when you return in glory, all the angels and the saints, my heart will still be singing. My soul will be the same. And all Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise and Christ be magnified in me And oh, Christ be magnified The altar of my life and Christ be magnified in me There is nothing like having Christ magnify Himself in your life. It's like heaven coming and you knowing the fullness of God and being able to hold on to that. You know, Jesus talks about how precious heaven is and how precious the kingdom of God is. We read about this in Matthew's Gospel. He talks about two parables, one of the hidden treasure and one about a pearl of great price. He says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. When we experience the kingdom of heaven, when we know the glories of Jesus, his beautiful life in our life, it is everything to us. We're so grateful for what God has done for us. You know, we were just looking at this grand piano that we have in here and we're reflecting that we're trying to get rid of the dust on the outside. But we just noticed that there's dust on the inside. And you know what? You can have a moment where you can get yourself clean, get on the outside, or you can get dressed up. There's only one thing that can clean the dust away on the inside. And that is having Jesus in your life, who forgives you of your sin, and sets you up to new life in Him. And so when we come to celebrate the sacrament of Holy Communion, we are celebrating the fact that Jesus has come to us. He is of immeasurable worth to us and that through His work on the cross and His glorious resurrection, we can have ourselves clean from the inside out. That dust can go and then we can live in the glorious life that He has for us. So As we prepare ourselves for communion, we become, we come before our great God. We come to bless Him and to know His blessing upon us, to also know His presence and His power. He is the sovereign God, ruler of the heavens and the earth. And He has come to us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so it is that we remember that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take this and eat it. This is my body given for you and do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for everyone for the forgiveness of sins. And do this whenever you drink it for the remembrance of me. With this bread and this cup, we do as our Saviour commands. We recelebrate the redemption He has won for us. Christ has died. Christ is risen. 
Christ will come again. And so we ask that God would pour out His Holy Spirit on all of us and on these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ, making us one with Him, one with each other, and one in ministry in the world. Let us come before God as we prepare ourselves in prayer. Lord, each time we break the bread and share the cup, each time we celebrate communion, it is about us recommitting our life into your life. My heart, my thoughts, my everything to you. Lord, come and fill each one of us today with your spirit. Help us to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to our hearts and help us to share and live out its message faithfully as you give us opportunity as your people. And I invite you as you are able to share the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And so, according to our Saviour's command, we set this bread and this cup apart for this holy meal to which he calls us. And we come to God with the ongoing prayers of our heart and we give thanks to God as we commune with him. And so I pray that in this moment, as you share the elements in your home, whether you're on your own, may you know the deep presence, the friendship of Jesus with you. But if you are with others, family members, or maybe a friend, break bread and share it first with the other before yourself as we live out the way of Jesus and our hearts are nourished in faith as we share in communion together. So I invite you now to break bread and share the cup with those around you.
shout your praise our hearts will cry these bones will sing Shout your prayer, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. As we come back together, having shared communion with each other, I want to declare to you that through Christ, your sin is forgiven. May you know an inexpressible joy because of that wonderful truth. And may you have a sense that you are now no longer dusty on the inside. Next week, we have Mother's Day and we've got a very special service planned for you. In fact, we're going to be able to release something which you're going to be able to uh, share together and enjoy that release will come closer to the day. This doesn't take the place of you getting that special something that you need to for your mother. I know some of you will have uh, memories about mothers who are no longer uh, with you and through this week, may you know that our love and prayers are with you through this time. If you have taken a photo of your Holy Communion, please send that in to us. We'd love to see how you are celebrating Holy Communion in your home. May you continue to walk powerfully in the truth of God's Word May you continue to grow up into maturity in Him through His great love. And may you know the presence of Jesus, our cornerstone, the precious one walking with you. We are connected together through Jesus. Nothing can take that away. And God is still building His people to share of the truth and His might and to proclaim His fame in this world. Great to be with you. See you soon. <laughs>